Well, hello. Welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us. Tim Booth is an Irish musician, artist, illustrator, and writer. Tim studied art at Trinity College in Dublin. An accomplished artist, his work has shown and sold at solo exhibits and became he became known as Ireland's first pop artist. Mr. Booth has also contributed artwork to comics, a fanzine, a novel, and created live animation shorts. Tim is one of the founding members of experimental psych folk band, Dr. Strangely Strange in Dublin back in 1967. The band released a couple of albums and toured quite a bit before calling it a day in 1971. However, over the years, there have been reunions for tours and in 1996 came a third album. Yes, the band is still alive and well. In fact, as we speak, Dr. Strangely Strange is rehearsing, playing live gigs, and even preparing to record new material. Well, welcome, Tim. Hello, how are you? All right, thank, thank you for joining me. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning, uh, talk about where you were born. Well, I was, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, I was born in a place called Kill, which is just south of Dublin. Okay. It's an Irish word, really. It means church. Church. Sure, sure. uh, in 1943. Okay. Okay. Uh, talk about some of the memories of your childhood there. Well, it was a, it was a much simpler time. Yeah. Um, I, we didn't have electricity when, when in 1943. Uh, we had a windmill and uh, batteries. I remember my father putting uh, con condensed water, what do you call it? Con specialized water into them. Oh, condensation, yeah, condensation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, okay. And, and for the windmill, oh, okay, all right. Did you... Uh, did you guys, I guess, back in those times, uh, left the door open, you, kids playing out at night? Oh, yeah, all of that kind of thing, yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, it was a small farm. We grew up in, in, in a very kind of easy way. Yeah. I mean, it was, they were quite tough times because there was, there was all kinds of um, shortages after the war. But, yeah. Right, right. I, my earliest memory would be about 1945, I think. I don't remember much anything before that. Okay, okay. Were uh, either one of your uh, parents uh, musically inclined at all? Yeah, my mother played the piano. She was quite good. She was, you know, she liked to play a bit of Chopin. Oh, okay. Okay, so classically. Yeah, she wanted me to learn to play the piano, but uh, when I was about... 13 the piano wasn't very sexy so i wanted a guitar so she went out and got me one <laughs> <laughs> okay but she had a, a notion how to play it in, in those days nobody played the guitar or very few people right right these days every second person plays it right right did you ever play a ukulele no no well, okay. I, I i have played it but we didn't play it back then yeah, I've heard a lot of uh, guitar started out with the, the ukulele. So yeah. it's interesting. Um, well, do you, you recall, uh, you, you said your mom played the piano, so that, was there music being played in the house? Do you remember? Yeah, there was a bit. I, we, there was, it was pre-television, so we listened to the radio a lot. But Irish, mostly Irish radio, but we also listened to the, to the BBC Light Programme, which played what was then popular music like um so you would hear the occasional in the 50s the occasional when presley started came up you'd hear a little bit of him you'd hear the Everleys. and when i went to boarding school at the age of eight or nine uh and there were people that had records there and gramophones and things and so that was quite good oh okay all right did you did you ever have a, your own uh record player at that age. We did, yeah. My mother had a thing called a pie black box, oh, okay. which was it was a very early stereo system. It had the speaker each side of the of the whole of the box itself, which was about this wide. It was quite good, it was high fidelity. Oh, for that time, well, that's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to crank it, did you? 
Oh, oh wow. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we got electricity. We she got a few things like that. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Um, do you recall uh, the first single or album that either someone got for you or that you you purchased? Uh, gosh, my elder sister was mm -hmm. was quite into Fats Domino. She was in art college. Okay. Uh, she brought back. Uh, not sorry, not Fats Waller. Fats Waller, not Fats Domino. She brought back my very good friend, the Milkman, oh. which I half liked. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, my mother, my mother got uh, Ravel's Bolero, which I thought was quite good. I like that because of repetitive rhythms, which uh, set me on my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, I mean, that that has been uh, sampled so much, you know, in other songs throughout the years too. Yeah. And in movies, of course. Well, uh, how about when you uh, became a teenager? Uh, what about some of the the music and the bands that you started getting into? Oh, oh well, I like the Everly Brothers, um, and, and we had a band in school. I went to a, a co-educational school okay. uh, run by the Quakers in Waterford. So um, the the same one that the late Sinead O'Connor went to. Actually, she went there briefly, way after me. Yeah. Um, and we had a little band there, uh, and a couple of acoustic guitars, really. And we used to do Everly Brothers songs. And there was an English skiffle uh, king called Lonnie Donegan. We did a few of his songs. And anything else that we could manage. <laughs> did did any, anybody play the washboard? <laughs> no, no, not really, no, no. <laughs> No, uh, we didn't have a drummer. <laughs> okay. Well, um, <clears throat> how about, um, did you start going to concerts at that age at all? I, well, the school had a very open policy to music, and uh, it, had, it actually had a music uh, society. And we used to go down one, maybe once a month, we'd go to something in the city of Waterford, which had a musical society, which... Uh, had a lot of classical music. So I heard Julian Bream, I heard Peter Pears in, in a small theater, like 300 seater. Uh, I heard, I think his name was Futong, a classical pianist, quite a lot of classical stuff, yeah, The Messiah, yeah. but oh. not much popular music. However, there was a, a show band in Waterford, which is an, a big entertainment group that played ballrooms all around the country called the Royal Show Band. And we used to play rugby against, against a local school. And one of the Royal Show Band guys, their singer, Brendan Boyer, I think he played rugby there because we called him the tank. He was an enormous guy. And it was very <laughs> difficult to, to, to uh, tackle him. Yeah. But the, there was another guitar player in the Royal Show Band and he taught, he taught us a few little pieces of, of primitive rock and roll playing on guitar. So we 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 could do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Some, some early oh, I think we got we had a few Chuck Berry licks as well, because he'd just come on and come come about. Yeah. yeah. I heard yeah how influential he was. And so you got your early education there. Yeah. Um, well, uh what about uh uh first the first band that you were in? Uh, any bands before Doctor Strangely Strange? Uh, yeah, I was in a I was in a junk band for a while when I was in college, uh, called the House of David Junk Band, okay. with a couple of other guys. One of whom was a, was an early member of Doctor Strangely Strange, a guy called Brian Trench. Because oh, okay. we really formed the band in Trinity, in Trinity College. Uh, like I was a student at the time, and so was Brian, and so was Ivan, and there were three of us started the band together. Okay. Okay. But uh, no recorded material. No, well, we there, somewhere there is a, a, a tape. But <laughs> I've long lost it, but it might be extinct somewhere. <laughs> was it, it was recorded by by a sound technician called Liam Soren, who worked in Ardmore Studios, the, the film studios in near Dublin. And actually, the quality was really good. He recorded it on a uh, a Sure or not a Sure a, a what do you call it? I, I can't remember the name of the a very good film tape recorder. 
I can't remember his name. His name like Sure. Sure is a microphone, but I can't. It'll come to me at some stage. Well, it, it was a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah, that would be fascinating if that was unearthed. If somebody located that and, and uh, remastered it or or what have you, that would be something. Well, I think uh, it's lost. <laughs> Well, uh, I talk about uh, getting up to uh, Dr. Strangely Strange, uh, talk about the formation. First of all, who uh, who coined the name? Uh, we, we had a, a an acquaintance uh, friend called Jim Duncan, and he had an expression when something was a bit out of the ordinary. He'd say, well, that's strangely strange. And we kind of liked that. And then uh, Dr. Strangelove and How I Stop Worrying and Learn to Love the Bomb came out. Yeah. Yeah. So we just put the two together. And also was, there was Dr. Strange comics floating around in the background as well. Oh, okay, okay. The Marvel, yeah. Yeah, so it kind of made, it made a kind of uh, obtuse sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it was different enough not to uh, cause it's, copyright. It stood out. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And it allowed us not be a rock band. Like we weren't right. not, at that stage, we were not a rock band. <laughs> right. Or a beat well, group. <laughs> well, talk, talk about the formation, the uh, the origins and all of that, how every everything came together. Well, we I I was I played a lot of, of kind of folk music and I I liked uh, I liked um, Quite a lot of American bluegrassy kind of things. I like the I like the Lost City Ramblers a lot. I used to do a few of their songs, and then and then Dylan arrived on the scene, and there was a little folk club in Dublin called the Pike, and there was an American guy arrived in called Andy Leader, and he had a a very nice Martin guitar, and he had Don't Think Twice It's All Right, and he had the pick, and we'd never heard a song like that, oh. so. Uh, he taught it to me, and I still play it. If I play it, I still play it the way he played it. Is that right? Uh, and he was a really nice guy, a really good player. Uh, and I think he got drafted to Vietnam, and I think he died there. But I'm not certain of that. Yeah, yeah. Mm, okay. Right. Well, uh, so it was uh, originally uh, you and uh, Ivan. Is it Ivan or Ivan? Ivan. 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 Okay. Yeah, myself and Ivan. Ivan. Ivan had been playing a bit of a guitar with a, a, a Trinity beat group called the Vampires, standing in for uh, playing kind of rhythm and lead and singing. And he was quite good at it. Uh, <laughs> so we kind of, I don't know how we, we sort of drifted together. He had a flat in Baggett Street and I used to go around there and we'd listen to uh, uh, the early blues recordings, like Howling Wolf and stuff like that, we'd listen to that and wonder how 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 could you do that? Yeah. But we didn't really do it. And then then at about that time, the Incredible String Band came out with their first album. And now this this was very interesting to us because they were writing their own material, and it was about their everyday lives, and it wasn't about American things per se, or English things. It was about small time Scottish things. And we thought, well, we could do that. You know, realize that you could write songs much that were much more small in their outlook, if you like. Yeah. So we started, we started writing and playing. And Brian Trench, who was, who was a good piano player and a pretty good guitar player and a great dancer, he, uh, he whipped me out a much better musician actually than we were. He whipped us into shape with our harmonies. And then he went off, he, he left because it was 1968 and he wanted to, to man the barricades in Paris or to observe the manning of the barricades in Paris. So he went off there and did his thing. Is that right? Okay. And uh, we, we drafted in a, a painter friend called Tim Goulding because he could play keyboards and he could play tin whistle. Okay. And he, he had been classically trained, so he had never worked without reading the dots. Mm -hmm. So we had to kind of get him to, you know, to throw all that away. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've, I've, heard, I've heard stories about that. People that were classically trained or took lessons, and they only went so far because it was so limiting. In yeah. Action. 
and it was like they, they wanted to be more free free yourself up and and yeah. so they yeah broke free of that yeah so we, we we forcibly freed him from all of that but i don't know if that was a good thing because but he's he still is you can hear this piano playing you can hear that he's been taught properly yeah whereas ivan and myself taught ourselves okay right self-taught well uh, uh, i was going to ask you about that uh, how did you differentiate with two tones in the band did you guys have nicknames for each other or uh, yeah, numbers. well, it was he, he was Goulding and I was Booth, basically, you know, like, uh, we just, we, we just didn't think about it, didn't worry about it. <laughs> Still don't. And now yes. now we, have, we have Joe Tom on fiddle as well, so that's, he's, he's, he's the youngest of us. I think he's a mere 70. So we, we tend to call him Baby Strange. I was going to say, he's a pup. Yeah, yeah he, is. <laughs> he is actually more ways than one. He's a really good fiddler, and be, I think it's I think it's the Polish blood. He plays with a funny kind of dissonance that's really good. And kind of, there's a sort of like a slightly European feel to what he does. He might deny that, but I I hear it. You hear it, okay? <laughs> well, uh, you guys were uh, first signed to Island Records, right? Beware, yeah. But, well, we we were we were picked up by a, a, an American producer who was living in London, Joe Boyd, and Joe came over and heard us play in a in a little hall in Carlo. Uh, myself, Ivan, and Brian Trench actually Goulding hadn't joined us at that stage, and saw what it was that we did, uh, but kind of said, "No, I don't think I'm going to go with these guys." And then there was a, a, an American company called ESP Disc, run by a man called Bernard Stolman. And somehow or other, he got word of us. I don't know how that happened. And he came to Ireland and he offered us a recording contract on ESP Disc, which, where the Fugs were, were uh, ensconced and Sun Ra and a few other people like that. And we were going to go with him. And then we thought, look, we better tell Joe. Well, actually, the, 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 there was a woman who had linked us with Joe, a woman called Antia Joseph, who subsequently worked for Witch Season and did a lot of work in the music business in England. And she said, look, boys, you've got to tell Joe that you, you're thinking of going with Bernard, because he just had a courtesy, because he came over to see you. So we did. And he thought, oh, well, in that case, I'll sign them. To not to not to any record company, but to to record with him. So he paid for our recording, and we went to London and recorded about twelve songs, most of which went on to the first album in a very beautiful studio called Sound Techniques, which is a very famous little small artisan studio where Fairport recorded, Nick Drake recorded. Uh, various other bands that Joe had recorded in there, and Joe had a very nice way of doing it. So that's how we got started. So we never went with the ESP disc. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that being in the uh, recording studio. Was that a little intimidating at, at the time? It, it was. We didn't really. We didn't, we, luckily, we had done this one little bit of recording with the Ardmore Sarman, Liam Sarman. A year, that's what the tape recorder was called, a year. Oh, there you go, okay, all right. A, a very good tape recorder. So um, we weren't, I mean, because we didn't know very much about it, Joe just sat us around in a semicircle and said, play, and put mics around, and it was a very good acoustic room. So we played live, you know, it was, there was, there was a certain amount of overdubbing later, but, but the initial thing was done live the voice and the guitar at the same time okay yeah so that in that album was uh kip of the serenes it was kip of the serenes yeah, yeah released which is time. which is was an, as an expression of goulding uh goulding's any time we saw a policeman mm -hmm. he was known as a serene boy so oh. kip of the serenes was a warning that there was a policeman if we were if, which of course we never did have any illegal substances about our, our person, <laughs> but we never would do a thing like that. No, no, we were good clean boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I'm going to start using that phrase around here, okay? Yeah, uh, okay, you're, uh, you're allowed, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to tell my my son who's me. Uh, well, he's 17 now. He's been driving for a year, and tell him to to you know beware. <laughs> yeah, well, if you see if you see the flashing lights in your rearview mirror, it's skipping the streams. It's skipping the streams, <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> so, uh, what? Uh, what what are your your uh, recollections memories of 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 the album um, as far as like the the critics what did they say and the reception and, and that uh, the, it it was quite well reviewed in in kind of a folky type magazines such as they were at the time and in the folk pages of the the music press um, but people didn't really know what it was about uh, and. You know, I mean, that had tracks that were nine minutes long, and that was a bit much as well. So it didn't it didn't get a lot of airplay. <laughs> right, you're, you're not going to find that. <laughs> and, and it it came out on the island because I I think Joe was putting other stuff. He had, he had John Martin and Nick Drake, and they were going on to Ireland. And I think he managed to just put us on as well. It was a lease tape deal. It was, the island were, were, didn't own us. We, I mean, we were. Ne I never stepped through the door of Island Records in my life. Okay. I stepped okay. through the door of Witch Season, which was Joe's company. Ah, okay. Well, I always liked the, the album cover. Uh, I always liked that. Where where was that picture? Take it was here. taken It was taken in the Dargle Valley, up in, uh, up just in uh, North Wicklow. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was a place that we used to go to a lot. And it was just, just in, it was really in the garden of Tim Goulding's father's house. Okay, okay. Yeah, I always, always think of that. And the, the, the back cover was, a, I, I made the back cover a painting that I, I did. Yes, yes, that's nice also as well. Well, uh, for the uh, second album, why uh, the switch to Vertigo? Well, I think, again, it was a, it was a matter of, lease, of leasing to Vertigo. Okay. So okay. Ireland didn't want us anymore because we didn't actually sell thousands of records. <laughs> right. right. So, but they did put us on their sampler, nice enough to eat, which was very good for us because now all the stupid people started to hear us. So suddenly we were getting lots of gigs in the university circuit, and we we played we played the Paradiso in Amsterdam and places like that. So we started touring properly and. Uh, we we got a, a, a very good manager called Stephen Pierce, who's a, a was and still is a very good ceramicist potter oh, from really? Cork. And he 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 was a great hustler. He got us a van. We had a very we got a very nice PA eventually, a very good WEM PA. And we were we were quite well equipped. And then we got ourselves a drummer. Who because we thought we thought we needed to get a drummer uh -huh. because we were starting to play electrified instruments to be heard because it was very hard to pick up acoustic to, to mic up acoustic guitars. And it was before you had electroacoustic guitars. They they weren't they weren't around really. So we started, Ivan got himself an electric guitar, which he used on about half of the numbers. So when, when that happened. We thought we better get a drummer, and I started to play some bass. Okay. And and I found most basses were, you know, that you were like kind of, you know, like like this. <laughs> but I found in the junk shop in the north of England, I found a little Vox bass. Okay. Which was the same size as an electric guitar, much easier to play. So I could play that, and we put it through a big Ampeg amp uh, or an H and H. I can't remember which. And it actually delivered quite a lot of bottom. And Hoppy, who we found by asking for a drummer, like through the music pages, he came to a gig and came up afterwards and said, I'm a drummer. <laughs> and so we, gave him, we gave him a bit of a test there and then and we thought we would find that he could he could hold rhythm better than we could. So that was a good time. You're high. Um, <laughs> so then we got him a little Heyman kit. Uh -huh. Which was great because we we needed to be we didn't have a big van we couldn't have huge drum cases, and he was very good and he held us together all the time. We actually with him, with him playing, we became a, a much more viable unit. We still weren't really a rock band, 
but we were kind of a good folk rock band because we wanted to be. And half of it was acoustic and the other half was electric, not the gigs. Right. Well, speaking of the, the live shows, uh, Gary Moore would play with you. Oh, yeah. But, but we, we stayed in a house most of the time. We lived in a house in Sandy Mott when we were in Ireland. And this, this house was, was a kind of a, it wasn't a, a free house, but uh, Philip Linnett from, from uh, Tin Lizzy was a good friend over the years. Uh, and we knew him well. I mean, he was quite a lot younger than us, but he had got hold of a new guitar player and he asked us to, to mind him. So he introduced me to this pimply youth in, in the, in the Bailey bar in Dublin. And it was Gary, and we, we took him back. Um, and uh, he had a guitar, and, and like he took it out and started to play it. And it became evident this guy was ridiculously good. <laughs> <laughs> and we wanted, we wanted to hold on to him because he was, he was also lovely to be with, very nice. He was just a very nice human being, as far as we were concerned. And he, he loved to play music, and he loved to play music with us. So when we came to record the second album, Heavy Petting, and Gary wasn't doing anything, he came down to the studio and just played. And we had um, Dave Maddox from Fairport playing drums. This is before Hoppy had joined us. Once we'd done that with, with Maddox, we realized we needed to have a drummer. Yeah. Um, okay. After that, after the yeah, thing with him. These, these days we don't have a drummer again, but occasionally we do. I mean, occasionally we get drums and bass in. Some friends will come and play. Oh, okay. Get in with you. Yeah, I was going to mention that about Dave Maddox. Well, uh, of the uh, of the two albums, uh, which one are you more partial to? Oh, that's that's a difficult question because there are bits of both albums I hate. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and bits of both albums that I like. Yes, I, at some stage we ought to really put out a best of because then we would take the better numbers from all all the albums that we've done because we've done a couple we did we did the 28 years after heavy petting we did the difficult third album which was uh alternative medicine yeah um and that's gary played on that as well yeah third, yeah 20 so that was 20 20 28 years later something okay. like that you know 23 i'm not sure it's a long time later okay I was going to correct that, but uh, I had 26. I think it was. Well, maybe well, you're probably right. You're, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't okay. remember. That's all right. I can edit this part out. The uh, We'll talk about, uh, you guys did did play a lot, live gigs, and uh, maybe some memorable ones. Uh, oh, yeah. The, 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 we, we did, we did uh, a gig. We, we did a few gigs with Elton John. Uh, and I used to have a poster which said, tonight, uh, the Town Hall High Wycombe, Dr. Strange is Strange, support Elton John. But <laughs> after, after about, it seemed about 10 seconds, that flipped, and we, we had to support him for a few gigs. <laughs> it was a different kettle of fish altogether. I don't think I'll go there. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Well, uh, well you did uh, do a, a couple of uh, John Peel sessions. We did, yeah. But John John Peel, we we tried to get John Peel to play us, like by kind of sending him gifts and offers of things, <laughs> but he, he didn't. Right. And then. Yeah. Um, he came to, to uh, compare a show in Dublin in the National Stadium, and there were, there were four acts. There was Skid Row with Gary Moore, ourselves, the Liverpool Poets, and one other band. I can't remember who it was. But we went down very well with the audience. The Dublin audience really liked us at that stage. And uh, we had a great laugh, and they had a great laugh. And because we like to laugh a lot when we're, when we're playing music. And um, Heel afterwards came up and said, I never got you guys before, but now that I've seen you, I get you. So I'll be in touch. And he was. And we did uh, two or three shows for him, which were always very nice to do. Yeah. But, uh, but the tapes were erased, right? 
Uh, yeah, but some, there, there are bits of them out there because some, somebody somebody recorded yeah. it off the radio and so on. And they're, they're all a bit, they've been cleaned up and actually they've been released, but they, they're all a little bit um, yeah. not as good as they would have been if, uh, if, yeah. if they hadn't been kind of lost. Right? Yeah, the Radio Sessions album, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, 2022. Yes, yeah, some of the Danish radio broadcast and uh, yeah, yeah. off air off air recordings were salvaged. So it's it's amazing what's still out there. I, mean, I completely forgotten about that, that Danish radio broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, you know that's interesting to bring that up. You know, Danish and and you mentioned uh, Holland uh, playing there. Uh, I've heard I've heard in so many of these interviews how popular. The, the English musicians or you know, British UK musicians were over in Holland. Oh know? yeah, you know, and in fact they yeah. were more more popular there, and then they would go back home and nobody would know them. Yeah, that that happened quite a lot. I mean, first of all, we when we played in Ireland, we never really got properly treated or properly paid unless we ran the gigs ourselves. Right. Then when we got onto the university circuit in England, we did get paid. And um, you know, we would get between 30 and a hundred pounds sterling for a gig. And in those days that was a lot, quite a lot of money. I mean, we here we would get, we were looking, we'd get a tenner, 10 pounds for a gig. So we were suddenly making money in England. And then when we went uh onto the continent, um, especially in Holland, and we played a lot in Holland, the the it's it's a it's a densely populated country, and it had these so, these clubs called social clubs, which are run by the state, okay. and guaranteed by the state. So if they said they were going to pay you one hundred and twenty pounds or its equivalent, you you knew you were good for it, even if only two people showed up. So we loved playing there because we always got paid, um, and we like playing there anyway. We, we just like we like the ambience and, and the, the kind of laissez-faire that was right yeah, great place to play so some audiences were so incredibly stoned that <laughs> apparently so, the audience <laughs> all, all lay on mattresses and the first time we played there we played we played we talked quite well and there was kind of desultory clapping yeah i was like oh, no, it didn't go very well here did we and then when we finished there was kind of whistles and cheers and they wanted us to do another one. And then the, so when we came off, they said that was someone said some Dutchman said that was great. I said, but it didn't seem to go down. I said, no, I mean, we were all, you know, we were just, you know, the way it is, we were just just digging you. <laughs> <laughs> at one yeah. stage, at one stage we one parody sir gig, we were we were <laughs> Ivan was interpreting, I think on the electric guitar. One of his very delicate songs, and he turned around. There was a, there was a, a, a huge light show, and, which we were immersed in. And he turned around to look at the screen behind him, and they were showing clips of porn films in the middle of the light show. So there was a girl and a donkey, and I won't be more specific than that. It, well, I, and I even kind of stopped in the middle of his solo. <laughs> He was he was enthralled. He was enwrapped up in that. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's funny. That was great. Good times. <laughs> that's what I like about doing these is hearing stories like that. That that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, uh, okay. uh, well go we ahead. did we did another gig in in Belgium. Uh, th at this stage, Terry and Gay Woods were in the band because Tim had left to become a to 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 really paint. He, he, he was always split between painting and music, as any musician who paints is. You know, it's, it's, I, I feel, I know that to count on me as well. So Terry and Gay had joined, and Gay was singing, and Terry would play, and we would do a mixture of their stuff, our stuff, uh, and we were semi-electric. Now, Hoppy was the drummer. I played bass, or Terry played bass, depending on who was playing what. And so we, we were doing this gig, in Belgium, 
And we had a song of mine called I Gave My Love an Apple, which was a kind of very up-tempo song. And Ivan did a big guitar solo. <laughs> and so we, we went into the, the, the hall to do it, to set up a couple of hours before the show. And the stage was about 10 feet high from the floor. It was, you know, you were looking, maybe not that way, eight feet maybe, no, six high anyway and there were trap doors and there were doors in the front that led into the hall and we found on the stage there was a trap door and there was a ladder going down to these doors so we thought what a good idea it would be if when Ivan did his solo he was to jump down through the open trap door and burst out into the hall on a long lead uh -huh. and play this amazing solo yeah. <laughs> on this on the Japanese guitar that he had called a Kawaii. Okay. <laughs> which I think we again we bought in the junk shop in the north of England. <laughs> bought a banjo. <laughs> so so a, we rehearsed this very carefully and it all went very well in the sound check. Mm -hmm. That was great. And Ivan at that stage liked to play barefoot quite a lot. And it's not such a good idea to play an electric guitar barefoot, but you know, we would argue with him about that, but he would override us. So he 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 got into his solo and jumped into the <laughs> down, <laughs> into the, <laughs> down the ladder, if you like. And there was an incredible crash and liquid spurted up into the air, I could see it. And what the promoter had left a, a crate of opened beer down there, <laughs> which Ivan had, had hit feet first. So now he burst out through the doors and there was quite a lot of swearing in the middle of his guitar solo. And his hair was kind of standing up because he was being electrified. <laughs> he was getting oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> So he proceeded down the hall with sparks literally coming off him, playing the solo. And we managed to kind of turn off his amp so that he was okay by the end and he sort of walked back. And the audience thought it was all part of the act. Right. <laughs> they loved it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, look. Well, lucky he he didn't uh, you know really hurt himself there. Yeah, it was lucky he didn't cut himself. Um, <laughs> and it was just I think some of the beer just splashed onto his guitar. He wasn't getting a full two hundred and forty volts, otherwise he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have been able for anything. He was just getting he was just getting a. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he had a maybe he had a few swigs. Oh. <laughs> they they kind of know. leveled him out. <laughs> Made it up so bad. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, well, talk. Uh, you mentioned about Gay and Terry Woods. Well, uh, talk about um, the original band disbanded in uh, mid '71. I believe, like May, May '71. I think uh, that what was. Were, yeah. What yeah. were what were the reasons? Uh, well, it, it, it turned out that, that Gay and Terry were, were kind of going through the early part of a divorce proceedings. We didn't, we hadn't realized that their marriage was, was falling apart. And a lot of that was happening in the back of the van and that was, and, and sort of on stage to an extent. And that was really difficult. And also it, it didn't, they wanted to do a much more folky thing and we wanted to be much less folky really. So we just, we went amicably our own ways. And after, I mean, they formed the Woods Band and so on, and then they, their marriage finally broke up uh, a little in around that time, I think. And Terry went on to join the Pogues and Gay went on to, to have, have a band, sing in a band called Auto de Fe, who were a very good Irish band. Uh, so it was it was a plus for both of them really that we split up I think and a plus for us because at this stage we realized it wasn't working so we came back to Ireland and kind of licked our wounds and recouped and met up with Tim again and decided we should play some music together so we've been doing it ever since yeah yeah because he can't resist it <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's and if you're, he's yeah. a musician he's a songwriter so if you're a songwriter you're always writing songs you know you're playing to write a song you're, right, you're, right. you're waiting to catch it out of the ether. You know, they're up there somewhere. Right. 
and you right. play, you're playing, and suddenly it comes in, yeah. or part of it does. And yeah, you, you can't, you can't you, change your you can't change your basic nature. I mean, it's it's who you are, you know. Yeah, it and is. <laughs> and that, has, that has to come out. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Well, you did uh, soldier on uh, with a new lineup briefly through '73. Yeah. Uh, what? Who, who was in that lineup? Sorry. Oh, who, Winters, who was in, who was Winters, in that, that that lineup that you you? Oh, when we did. When we did the thing called a horse box tour. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah we, we, there was um, there's myself and Ivan and Tim, a drummer called Derek Boston, who was one of the show band drummers, who could also sing, which was a plus, because he could add in a harmony. Uh, a fiddle player called Don Knox, who, had a, who went on to be in a band called Spud, which was Paul McGuinness's first band to manage before he got you two together. And, okay. and then we, there was a, a, a friend of ours from college uh, who subsequently became a, a, quite a well-known lawyer called Steve Bullock, and he played sax and flute. And unfortunately, he died about a year ago. So, um, And that band toured Ireland and played in Derry uh, during the, in the really worst times. And, we ran into all kinds of trouble up north. We didn't cause it, uh, but we met some pretty obnoxious people and got stopped at roadblocks and things. And that was very hairy because a little later, the, a, a band called the Miami were, were caused a roadblock and shot, bombed. Yeah. That's right. And so we had, we had a, a little touch of that, but it was the British Army who stopped us. Okay. But they weren't pleasant. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you had any run-ins with the IRA or anything like that. Well, we didn't really have any run-ins with the IRA, but because because we were southern, you know, we were it was it was the other side that didn't like us. Okay. So we were driving around in the southern registration land road with a horse box on the back with the gear in it, and we yes. get stuck in convoys of land rovers, and we would just kind of wait for someone to open up on us. Oh, this is not good. <laughs> oh no, no, that would not. It's be funny a... now, but it wasn't funny at the time. There you go, right, right. You can laugh about it now. Yeah. Wow. Well, you you did mention uh, you, uh, Tim Golding, Ivan, and uh, Joe Toma uh, got together in uh, the early '80s, and it's been that core lineup since, yeah, right? Ever since, and we occasionally have have a drummer. Uh, sometimes, like. I have a I have a son who's a really good bass player, Jesse, and he has got up with us occasionally. And Tim has a nephew who's a really good drummer. Sometimes he will play the drums. And Ivan has a son who's a very good guitar player. So I mean, they will sometimes, if they're not doing anything, augment us. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it, they've got that uh, musical gene in their family. I, I tell you, we need all the augmentation we can get. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I hear you. Well, after, uh, I think we maybe agreed on that, 26 years, uh, the third album uh, yeah. came out in 96. What was that like, the experience recording again? It was lovely. We, 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 we took, a, I think we were nearly took about a month to do the main recording. And we had a, a, an engineer, a Swiss engineer called Bruno Statling, who also was pretty good drummer. So he drummed with us. And we had a bass player who played with us for a number of years called Tijim Tutti. Okay. Uh, and then Tijim has played in various bands, including Auto De Fe. I think he was bass player in them with Gay Woods for a while. And he's a very good bass player. So uh, that, that, that helped. And then he went off with, uh, after, after we'd done that, he went off with Riverdance doing sound. Oh, really? For them, so he wanted to go around the world, so that was fine. Yeah, okay. and um, we've had other bass players. We did, we did a tour of Scotland after that came out with uh, two young, uh, two very young men from Ken Mare, two brothers who sang. One played bass and one played drums, and they came with us, and they were great because they would augment us very nicely, and they augment the, the singing. Part of it. And if we run, ran out, because in Scotland we had to play a couple of Cayleys and things, yeah? 
and, yeah. and we ran out of material, so they would do some of their material, and, and they would do all it, like the bass player was very good. He was kind of a very good Elvis impersonator, so he'd sing a couple of Elvis Presley things, <laughs> and we just play them. <laughs> we couldn't play <laughs> Elvis Presley songs. <laughs> play along. We don't them. normally do covers. We once covered Van Van Morrison's uh, song at Stone Me because it seemed opposite. Yeah, and it was a relatively easy song to do. We used Thank to occasionally you. do that. That's the only cover we ever did. We're good, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's something. I mean, you know, to be proud of. I think that you all original, mostly original material. Yeah, know? always. Oh, but, uh, we would say it's because we're not good enough to play the, the, the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> but know about you. That. You will notice very few people ever cover us. So we have been covered a few times. A, a, a song of Ivan's called "Sign of My Mind," a big long one that Gary Moore played. That gets covered occasionally. Okay, okay. All right. Bands might have it in their live set because it's very easy to play and it's very easy to solo on. And so it's, it's a very good uh, what, uh, showcase for guitar players. Got you, got you. Well, uh, in the new millennium, the band is reconvened for uh, several shows marking special events. What are, are, are some of the special or memorable shows for you? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, any show we do is kind of memorable. The fact that we come out the other end of it is is uh, sort of extraordinary. Five. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a success story right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I we, we did. We did a we did a nice a nice series of gigs for Joe Boyd in okay. in the Barbican in London. That was really very nice, and we have a. I think we call him our London manager. He's a friend who got us to, to play in a string band convention for the incredible string band called Be Glad for the Song Is No Ending. We played that in Leeds about 30 years ago, maybe, yeah, something like 30 years ago, um, with Tijum on the bass and a, a South African drummer called Punk Koza playing. Uh, he was a very good drummer, a very good singer, but unfortunately subsequently died of AIDS. A lot of our drummers die. I don't know why that is. Um, and then we did this gig for Joe and Adrian, uh, who's our London manager, Adrian Whitaker, he put us on in the Jazz Cafe and that was very successful. Okay. And Gary was going to play that with us. Uh -huh. uh, but about two weeks before the show, he died. Wow. And so Adrian cast around and found a, a, a guitar player called Paul Simmons, who plays with a band called the Bevis Front, who are a great yeah. uh, psychedelic yes, I'm familiar uh, with. Yeah. rock band. And yeah. Paul is, is the, the youngest member of the Bev Bevis Front and a very good guitar player. And he knew Gary a little bit and listened to Gary's recording. And so he played electric guitar for us in that. And he he played his version of Gary's solo oh. and quoting from Gary, because he's good enough to be able to do that. He's a really beautiful guitar player, a lovely, lovely guy, very good friend. And whenever we can get him together, we, we bring him over and he plays with us. And when we do this recording, we might send them files to, to play on. Oh, see. Yeah, there you go. That's an idea. And we had on that one, we had a we had a a, a drummer called Paul Defer who did a lot of, of jazz work in England. And he unfortunately died last year as well, because we're all of an age now, you know. It's like right, right. Uh, but he was very good. He played several shows with us, including tiny little toilet pubs in England, but he didn't mind. He did it because he wanted to see how, how we played together. And he, I think he enjoyed playing with us. We certainly enjoyed him. He's a very good drummer. Well, you, well, you know, you mentioned that of, of age. Uh, most of my interviews are, you know, people around your age. Uh, <laughs> get them, because, get them while you can. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. The late 60s, early 70s, that's that's right up my alley. That's that's the time period of the kind of music that I really enjoy. And so I, I approach musicians from that time period. And be, believe me, yeah, they're becoming fewer and far further between, further between. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely we, we, worked, we, we worked out the other day. Our combined age is something like 306. Wow. 
Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be 80 in September, and Ivan is 80 in about a week. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Gooding's like 78, and Ch Baby Strange is 70. He's yeah. a, mere, a mere stripling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're right about that, <laughs> stripling. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it is not, you know, great that you guys are still you know, going, going strong. Uh, it's, it's not as easy in a way as it used to be. Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to be lifting heavy gear, so we use much lighter gear for a start. You know, the, the gear has changed. Um, and the PAs have changed, they're much smaller, and you can run your sound off an Apple Mac if you know how to do it, you know, off an iPad. Uh, I don't actually know how to do that, but my son does. He, he has a band, so he runs his, his, uh, his stage sound from, from the stage. Uh -huh. you, want, you want to give a plug here? Yeah, they're called the, they're called the Suitcase Trio. Okay. okay. All right. the, 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 the name says it, they're a trio, guitars, bass and drums, Jesse plays the bass and great guitar player. And the, they use suitcases a lot when they show up at gigs, they can set up very quickly. They kick drums a suitcase. Oh, okay. Right. I like that. I like that idea. Okay. Suitcase. You can look them up. They have, they, they have, you can find them on the web, on the, okay. the interweb. It's All called right. the, is it called the interweb or the internet? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, you mentioned Adrian Whitaker a little yeah. bit ago. Uh, what did you uh, think about when he uh, he approached you about writing the book about the band? Oh, we thought that was great. We were yeah. very pleased with that. And he did a great job. It's, it's really good. Um, and it's very hard to get hold of now because he, he only released a, a limited amount and I think the plates are destroyed so uh, it's it's now a huge collector's item yeah. right yeah it's funny how that happens yeah, yeah. There you go. but like, it's 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 a really good book it's really funny um most of the stories are in it. one or two didn't get in because they were not really printable <laughs> you had to get you had to get a PG rating on on that or something, you know. <laughs> okay, I understand. Um, well, well, moving over into uh, the the art territory, the artwork. Uh, you designed the original logo for Thin Lizzy, right? I did, yeah, yeah. The one that had a kind of an arc on the top, of it. and then mm -hmm. that was taken over by Jim Jim Fitzpatrick. Yeah. He, he he made a version of that and then thought I can do better than this and, and made what a, a logo which was much more concise and was better. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, that's that is a striking you know a logo for sure. And I think it kind of uh emulate, I mean not emulate, but kind of depicted the band, you know, and uh you know, was very, very much, you know, of the time too. Yeah. Well, what about what about uh any any Phil Lennart memories? Um, yeah, but Phil, Tim Gilding's uh, girlfriend at the time was a woman called Patricia Moen, and for some reason she was known as Orphan Annie. She became she subsequently became his wife, and then they they split after uh, 12, 13 years more. Yeah, um, and she unfortunately is dead as well. She died a few years back. Uh, but she had a house, a Georgian house that she rented of rooms in, in Mount Street. And this became known as the orphanage because oh. she was orphan nanny. Yeah. Over orphan nanny. <laughs> and so Philip used to come around there when he was, oh, 15, 16, 17, 18, those kind of ages. Uh, very young when we first met him. It's strange kind of hair. And, and you'd see it in the photographs. And very diffident, and very shy, but writing songs and very interested in the fact that we were writing songs. And as Adrian's book points out, the, the, the kind of alternative art scene and music scene and writing scene in Dublin was really quite small. Everybody knew each other. And it, there wasn't that much rivalry. Everybody tended to help each other. These days, it's rivalry that I see and hear. But then it was, was, what are you doing? Let's have a look. Look, I've got this. Can we add that in? You know, 
Phil might be doing something with his band and say, can you do some posters? Have you got a light show? You know, what can we do? Right. More of a communal type of Yeah, it was, it was a much more communal sense. And there was one particular pub in Baggett Street called Toner's, where we'd all meet, uh, partly because it didn't have television and it didn't have radio, didn't have a jukebox. It was a place for conversation. Right. Um, and we'd meet there. Uh, and it was quite near the art college, so you get a lot of the art students coming in. So there was a great kind of cross fertilization. It was also near the Shelburne Hotel, where if there were any visiting stars, so that's where they would go. And then they would often take a wander around and find toners. So you'd suddenly, you might be rubbing shoulders with Peter O'Toole, who was a very nice man to have a drink with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, do you, do you still paint? Currently. I do, yeah, yeah. And, uh, this here, you can see it. That's that's one I did when I was in my rock star kind of sandy mound. Right, right. Hair. Yeah. And, uh, and just, few, just a few things here, but uh, uh, should I twist it around? There's sure. a few pictures on the wall. Sure. This is my studio we're in at the moment. You can do that. That's fine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, the... And the one behind you, I'm not a real, you know, art maven myself, you know, or know the, you know, real details and ins and outs of it. But uh, it's acrylic. It was done in it acrylic. It is acrylic, yeah. Yeah, it is acrylic. But I, I painted in, in acrylic at that stage. These days I paint mostly in oils and occasionally I, would, I might use some other media, but mostly oils. I love oils. There's a, a succulence to them that's lovely, you know. Right, right. The... Uh, well, I was going to ask you any particular reason that you uh, painted in acrylic back in in, in those times. Uh, well, it dried quicker, okay. so you you could, and also there was a there was a style of using lots of flat colors, you know, like pop art, liked large expanses of flat. Okay. So I used house paint, which is basically acrylic, like paint on the wall behind you. Huh? Like, yeah, it's it's basically an acrylic paint, and yeah. uh, the, the paintings I did with that. They haven't, they haven't crazed. I mean, that, that picture is about 60 years old. And uh -huh. it's like the day I did it almost. Yeah. That, that was actually sold and I bought it back at an auction because I liked it and thought I'd should... <laughs> buy it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, did, you, did you make money on that deal? Uh, no, but I didn't lose any. <laughs> there you go. Breaking even is not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a, a grandson who's he's what, 12, 13 now, and he's into tagging, you know, like oh yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And he's he was obsessed with that for a while, but I think he's I think he's moving through that phase of his obsessions. Uh -huh. <laughs> he also plays the drums, he's quite a good drummer. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well yeah. maybe he, that will we be might well. get him in the band if we <laughs> there you go. He, he can help out too. <laughs> Earn his keep, right? <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, I was going to ask you too about um, your portraits. Uh, you've enjoyed doing that kind of that kind of work. Oh you? yeah, I, I, I like to do portraits. I do a lot of. I, I, well, I used to. I don't do so much now. I do a lot of caricature work as well, like cartoon cartooning politicians. You know, like I. I don't, I don't work for any newspaper, but I put them up on the web and they, they normally get quite well received and sometimes get kicked around the world a bit, you know? <laughs> yeah, you definitely- I just do that, that as a, as a uh, you know, just a pastime. And I, I, I have one, I have a, an iPad I draw on, you know? Okay. So I use a program called, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's just a little, it's a very nice program I use. Um, let me just find it. Procreate. Okay. 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 Yeah. There's lots of stuff on Procreate. I don't know. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Paintings and cartoons and all kinds of things. I um, like your and you you've dabbled in uh, watercolor too, and I I like your uh, your landscape watercolor painting. Yeah, I just I just found those now. I, I like yeah, those. This, this, what I, these are small pictures, but they're in oils. There's the band. Yeah. Pull it over. 
Yeah, pull it over there. There you go. There, there you go. There you go. Oh yeah. See, that's what I like. That's, that's nice. That's oil. So it's not. Oh, oh, it's not watercolor. Yeah. These are all oils. These are all oils. Yeah. But, okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's nice. Are there those uh, areas around you, close to you? Yeah, they're, 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 uh, I do a bit of graphics. That's for a friend, Paddy Godwin, who's got a band called the Holy Ghosts. Uh -huh. Okay. Right we did a gig for him recently. That's him. Okay. <laughs> this is just the graphics, just the files. Just... So that's what I use as a kind of a sketchbook. But I would those pictures are done on canvas, but very often I draw direct into the pro, into procreate because you can draw on the surface of it with a with a pen like that, a specialized pen. Well, so nice. it's 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 a really nice way to do. It. I do, did all most of my, of the uh, illustration I do these days. I do on that. On that, well, and it's, you... so so it's it's um it's print ready. Uh huh. Yeah, you don't have to make separations. You just send it off to the printer. It's all ready. It's all ready. Well, you've seen you've seen the advances in technology. I mean, both in music and and oh, art. it's it's ridiculous yeah. huh? what you can what you can get up to. I'm just going to find something I want to show you if we, if we sure. have a moment. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Post. There you go. There you go. I like that. The ship. Yeah. I like uh, that. And it says the transcendental pollutant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very well said. <laughs> Hello. That's how we might describe ourselves these days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> I, I uh, particularly like your illustrations for uh, Nick Larder's Irish Tales. Oh, um, very, you must have been looking at my website. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, which, you, caught, you caught me. Yeah. Which, which uh, I have to update. I'm so lazy about it. Yeah. I think, the, yeah, go ahead. The, 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 uh, the website owners or the, the Wix, I built it on Wix, and, and they keep sending me. Uh, information about you know how I can update my site and how they've they've uh, got their stuff working much better. And every time I go to it, well, maybe I'll try it. Now. I can't remember how I did it. Oh, okay. So I, have to, I have to learn the whole thing again, and I can't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You have to watch out for those kind of things. I get one from uh, WordPress. I have a written interview site on WordPress. Um, but it's kind of gone by the wayside because I enjoy doing these video, you know, interviews more. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they keep sending me that kind of thing to a reminder, like, would you like to update, upgrade, you know, yeah. this, and they'll say like, it's free. Okay. But what they don't tell you is free for maybe two or three months. Yeah. And then, and then you got to pay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not completely free now. So there's always a catch, yeah, but um, yes. But um, yeah, I do like that from the Irish Tales. Uh, how long did it take you to do the the artwork for that? Uh, I, I did it on on the on on the iPad on Procreate. Okay. So I suppose each drawing took five or six hours. But I might not do it all in one go you know, because you can you can walk away from it and come back and you can look at it later and. Right. Uh, I used to always hold drawings up to a mirror to see where they were not very good because you see them fresh if you do that. Right. But on, on Procreate, you just press a button and it mirrors itself. Mm -hmm. So oh. you're, you're looking and you see the whole thing flipped. I say, yeah. oh, look, it's wrong there. Because when you, when you do that, it's like when you see the landscape mirrored, mm -hmm. a landscape that you know well, and you see it caught reflected in the window or something. I think, gosh, you, know, you, see, it, you see it fresh. Yeah? Right. You're right. You're right. It's a trick artists do all the time. Use the mirror. They're using the mirror. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, well, uh, that the, the, yeah, those are some nice, nice, uh, you know, anim, you know, animated pictures there. But so, watching. Speaking of your animation work, uh, 
It reminds me a little bit of Ralph Bakshi. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's that's so it would be in the same in that the animation is two D. You know, it's not it's not there's no there's not not really any computers in it. So these days, if I were to animate, I would use I would use Procreate. You can animate on that to some extent. My daughter does some animation on it. Oh, okay. She's an artist, but she's just discovered animation because I used to do quite a lot of animation. <laughs> but when you when you're using a machine like that, uh -huh. it takes. It, it does most of the work for you. Yeah, yeah. You don't awesome. have to do all the in-between drawings. Yeah. Well, I wondered how artists, animators did did that. You know, you don't have to do each cell like you that. You don't, you don't. No, you, the machine does it for you. And you yeah. can ask it to, you can ask it to put more in, to put less in, to change the timing, to do all of that. You know, and it's, so a lot of the tedium is taken out. Okay, okay. I don't. I don't have anything that's good enough on this to allow me to do proper lip sync animation. That's that's difficult to do. To take the voice, you have to break it into into sections and syllables and put each one to mouth shapes so that your mouth does its various things while you're you know you're moving while you're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it also. Uh, brings to mind a little bit of the animated movie Heavy Metal too. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting because I I worked in animation in Dublin for a number of years with an American Japanese animator called Jimmy Murakami, uh -huh, uh -huh. and Jimmy, who died a few years back, uh, Jimmy worked on the Heavy Metal okay. animations. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that I think that he directed a section with them. I think maybe he did the bit with the with the, the car in space. I think he did that. Oh, that one, yeah. The yeah. opening sequence. Yeah. That was really something at the time. Yeah. I think it, it was first. very much something at the time. And it was way before CGI and all, all the, the stuff that you can do now. Right. So to do that was was difficult. It was state of the art. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and these days you can do it at the drop of a hat. You know, I could probably do it on this. <laughs> Okay, well, <clears throat> I do appreciate it, Tim, very much. Thank, thank okay, you. Okay, it was your, a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for your, thank you for your time and for sharing those really <laughs> unique special. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you one more Ivan story that I think you okay, might. Okay, great, great, great. I, because Ivan played a, a, a kawaii guitar, we used to give him a, a, a headband with the rising sun on, you know, like the Japanese rising sun, and we'd introduce him as Ivan the Jap. To, uh, okay. to our, even though he had long blonde hair, Ivan the Jap, uh, who was, and we'd also introduce him as a failed kamikaze pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and one day we, we were doing a gig somewhere in the north of England, and an American came up to us after the show, big, tall, handsome galoot, and he said, Does Ivan still have his? Pilot's license. Pilot's. He said, "Yeah, of course, of course he does." <laughs> and he took us back. He took it. He had some girls with him, and he took us back. And he had some wacky backy and so on. And he took us back to his to his flat in this town. It might have been Leeds. I can't remember where it was. And he had all these posters on the wall saying things like armed love. Oh. And, and he essentially wanted Ivan to go to America, <laughs> to South America, and fly a light aircraft back into North America for him, which might possibly contain something. <laughs> uh, some illegal. So we, we just played him along for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and then we made our excuses and left. But I just love the idea that a failed kamikaze pilot would still have a, a pilot's license. Yeah. <laughs> right. They didn't take that from him. <laughs> <laughs> what shame he must have had to deal with, right? <laughs> that's fun. That's, that's a good one. That's he was great. tall and handsome, you know, like he was he was believable. <laughs> Oh my Good cowboy God. boots, I think he had on as well. I seem to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> oh.
Oh, yeah. I'll let, oh, you, yeah. I'll let you head off into the blue yonder, and I'll do the same. Good to talk with you. Yes, good to talk to you, Tim. And uh, we will definitely send you that link once I get it edited a little bit. That would and, be great. And then you can post it on your uh, social. And, Can uh, I? Oh, that'd be really nice. Yeah. 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 And, and tell everybody and spread yeah. the word. I shall do that. Yeah. All righty. Okay. Tim. All right. You have a you have a good rest of the day. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to hit leave now. Okay. All righty. Okay. Peace and love. All right. Peace.